Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the final session of IFOMP 2016. Uh, I'm delighted to be uh, presenting this session and um, welcoming Roger to the stage. Uh, people will have seen Roger in, earlier in the week, either here or in a very sweaty, nice and sleazy club. Uh, Roger's talk is going to build on the idea of what really constitutes best evidence, particularly for ther therapeutic decision making. He's going to offer thoughts and visions as to what the next chapter for evidence-based practice is and how we might look forward as a forward-thinking, progressive and expanding profession. I'd like you to welcome Roger Kerry to the podium. Gosh, hey, eh? what a week. Has everybody had a good time? Um, thank you, thank you, thank you so much um, for, for the whole week. Uh, thank you to, to Chris and IFOMP and the MACP and to MCI and to everybody who's turned up and made this an absolutely phenomenal event, for, not just for IFOMP but for the UK, um, which I think England is still part of. Um, but definitely uh, for Scotland, I've had an amazing time. So, um, <coughs> ex expanding our perspective on research in medicine. So, Chris and Helen asked me to talk about this, and I first wonder why have they asked me? <laughs> um, so, I'll try and explain why I think they might have asked me, and, and linking to this. So, the, I'm, I'm just going to give some of my, my comments of, of, about what I think the state of the profession is in with regards to its scientific research and the relationship with clinical practice and you know that's been a the theme all the way through through the week you know it was foregrounded on the first day by Gwen and Anne when they charted the history of, of, of what was happening and particularly with the comments on the art and science um, bit and you know I may be making all this up but I think we're at a stage in in not just physiotherapy science but uh, health science and medical science in in general where uh, we, may, we may be ready to, 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 as Chris said, to move on to a, a new chapter of, of some sort, and I'll try and explain why I think, I think that is. Um, uh, yeah, uh, this, is a love, this isn't Scotland, it's the Lake District, but it's uh, mountains, and Scotland's got mountains, tenuous link, but the, the real link is the little fella who's, who's stood there. Uh, if you're a fell runner, you'll know this is Joss Naylor, the country's, well, the world's greatest fell runner. He was 80 just in the last couple of weeks, and he's still running. He did a 30-mile run through the Lake District for his 80th birthday the other day. Um, and he has suffered since he was in his late teens with, uh, with severe uh, back pain. This is Hank Williams, died at 29. Your cheating heart. <laughs> Um, he died of low back pain. He died because he couldn't tolerate his pain, so he turned to drugs and drink and, um, and, and died as a consequence of that. But any historians on Hank Williams will tell you that the, the underlying cause of, of, of his death, although it was, it was uh, right ventricular failure, was, was really back pain. Two different individuals with two different stories, but there's one thing that unites them, and that's non-specific low back pain. Research allows us to, to cast some commentary on, the, on that picture, but only a little bit. The way research works at the moment and the way the uh, framework of um, evidence-based medicine is modelled allows us only some commentary on that. And I'm just wondering if we can make a, a different commentary on, on why one phenomena can have such a varied effect on, on individuals. Now, of course there's an average in there somewhere and these two could be classed as outliers, but I don't think that's good enough. Um, I, I wonder if there's a scientific method that allows us to make better commentary and better understanding of, of these I individual cases and also the individual cases that sit in the middle, the average, of which there's no such thing. I think, um, I think one of the background uh, sort of things that, that p possibly led Chris to, to, to sort of uh, invite me to come along was off the back of Trish Greenall uh, and her colleagues' uh, publication from just um, 
a couple of years ago, Evidence-Based Medicine and Movement in Crisis. Off the back of that, I wrote a blog. I called it Evidence-Based Physiotherapy, a crisis in movement. Back of the net. Did you see what I did? I swapped the movement in crisis round. Because we're like movement people. And, do you get it? God, I laughed for days when I did that. <coughs> And I wrote the blog reflecting Trish Greenelsh's uh, thoughts and tried to relate them to, to physiotherapy. So really, I suppose this talk is a bit is is is, is, is related to some of those to some of those points. So um, Lorimer said the other day the word crisis. Uh, you know. It also means opportunity, and in a real philosophical Kuhnian sense, that's exactly what it means. And I think we're at a point now we've, where we are in crisis, that crisis meaning we've got great opportunity to, to move on here, and um, I'll explain that. So where are we now? Um, <clears throat> where are we now in a number of dimensions? So where are we now? Well, we're in Glasgow, that's one dimension. Where are we now as a profession, and where are we now in relation to our profession um, and its position with, with other pro professions like, like medicine. So just, uh, just for clarity, I'll, I'll use the term evidence-based medicine, just, uh, but I'll mean evidence-based physiotherapy by that. It's just a little bit quicker to say, and I'm just used to saying it more than uh, physiotherapy. So I'll use EBM, evidence-based medicine, but I mean us, I mean us, okay? I'm talking about the concept. We have always be our, our practice has always been based at, on evidence, of course. The only difference is from 100 plus years ago to now is the nature of that evidence has, has changed. And I'm going to frame it like this. I'm going to say 1992 was a critical point in, in where it changed, although there's a, you, you know, a big lead up to that and a lead off from that. And, and that was the onset of the, uh, formerly the onset of Gordon Guyatt's evidence-based medicine movement. So I'm going to use that as a, as a particular point in time to, to keep reference to. So I'm going to take the uh, Guy Sackett et al. EBM movement as the model that we work in now. I'm going to take it literally in a very pedantic way. And, you know, if we're not going to take it literally, then what's the point of it? So it's the only way to interpret it. So the things I'll be talking about relate, relate to that and the way that EBM, post-1992 EBM structures, structures evidence. We're in a fantastic place in physiotherapy. The graphs that Gwen put up on day one showing the number of randomised controlled trials, the exponential increase of that over the last few years. We've changed dramatically as a scientific profession um, with, with regards to certain research methods. Um, and, and that's wonderful. We're learning much more about the world. We're learning much more about what we do. The question that Chris said, the, the evidence in, in particular that I'm talking about, is evidence of the best evidence for therapeutic effectiveness? Well, there is a way of EBM defining what that evidence is, and you, you know what that is, but I'm going to sketch it out again in a minute. So I think where we are now is 20 odd years down the line after, after 1992, and I think we've learned a lot, and we've, we've, we've followed the model, and we're doing it really well. And the prevalence of most of the dysfunctions we deal with is about the same or possibly increase. So th th there's something strange about, about that. And of course, we could say, well, you know, not all the good science is implemented yet in practice, so we need, we need more implementation. Hence the move towards knowledge transfer and implementation science, which is a good thing. But I wonder if there's another version of that, of that story, and I wonder if now's the time to say that. There are a few groups. Um, around the world at the moment. They're all, all having the same discourse. Just by chance, it would seem, but I wonder what's, what the forces are that have driven them to have that discourse. I'm, I'm uh, attached to a group called Cause Health, which I want to tell you more about. There's a group called the Critical Physiotherapy Network. That, they were sparked off by Dave Nichols in New Zealand. Um, with, again, a concern to what our profession is and where we are and where it's going. There's huge organisations and movements like the International Health Humanities Network saying, wait a minute, what is this thing called science? What's it doing? If, if our job and the job of medics is to save people's lives and make people better and in, in, increase the quality of life and make society work better, that's, that's really, really important stuff. And we're, 
we use this other stuff called research, scientific research, to determine what we do with regards to all that stuff. So this is a really important thing. Why aren't people talking about it a bit, a, a bit more? Um, there's the European Society for Person-Centred Healthcare, different, different perspectives on what a, an evidence-based framework should look like. And um, in the UK, well, it's not in the UK, it's a worldwide thing, but... Um, there's the campaign for real evidence-based medicine set up by Trish Greenhouse and uh, Neil uh, Macri there. And the, all these groups started at about the same time, and unknown to each other, we're all talking about the same thing. And it's only literally in the last year or two years or so that these groups have started to communicate a little bit more together and say, are, are, you, are you thinking about that as well? Yeah, we've been, we've been worried about that, and we've been thinking about this. And I think there's a real, uh, very positive, dynamic uh, tone to, to the world of health research at the moment, uh, not least because of, of, of groups like this. So this, th th this story is really a story of these sorts of groups, and of course there's many more, but I'll, I'll take the story of Cause Health, because I know more about it, because I'm involved in that project. But I will continually reference Trish Greenhouse because there, there, there are such parallels with what we're trying to do in physiotherapy and which um, the likes of Trish Greenhouse is doing in medicine that, that it's, it's, it's just worth always thinking that. In fact, she even wears one of our Cause Health t-shirts and I've got a Tuck Cause Health t-shirt on as well and I'll tell you why in a minute. And actually we might do something where you could win one of these as well. Yes, more competitions. Um, <coughs> Of course, so we do research to, to, to understand things and to work things out and to solve problems like what is the best evidence for therapeutic effectiveness. Um, we, we're never going to go back to, to a world of clinical freedom uh, where evidence, the, the sole source of evidence is from our clinical expertise and clinical judgment. That's not... That's not where the, the world can go. It's, be, it's, it's been there. Um, but there must be a, a way of reframing the, the position that our patients sit within, within evidence-based medicine in a, in a scientific way. So I'm wondering if, the, if, if what Joss Naylor and Hank Williams could give us could have some sort of scientific validation and their stories and the, the, the things that um, are, are present in those two individuals rather than a population made up of a variety of individuals can be scientifically le legitimised in some way to start to be referred to as a legitimate source of evidence for um, therapeutic uh, effectiveness. But to do that, well we can't do that because the the rules of evidence-based medicine don't allow us to do that. And I'll explain a bit why that is, and I'll explain a bit why I think we can, um, uh, where we might go for this. What I want to do is talk about two, two problems, one very briefly and one a bit unbriefly or uh, longer, something like that. Uh, the empirical problem. So Gordon Guy, the first thing he wrote about evidence-based medicine in the very first publications was, We've got this thing, we're going to call it evidence-based medicine. We used to call it clinical epidemiology, but that was too long for people to say, well, we're going to remarket it, repackage it, and call it evidence-based medicine. It sounds really good, because it sounds like if you do it, you're doing something really good. You're basing your practice on evidence. And of course, um, it, it's, it's, um, it's a platitude, it's a slogan, because who on earth wouldn't want to do practice based on evidence? So they'd already captured the whole world in... in in one publication. But one thing he said was, you know what, we don't know if this is any good or not, and there's absolutely no way to prove if evidence-based medicine could be good. It, there's a paradox that prevents us from finding evidence that evidence works. So there's an empirical problem side to that. Um, and, well, you, you'll see the irony in trying to understand if evidence works th through doing further research. Um, but, you know, one, one of the most prolific authors uh, on, on that, and I, I'm not 
I'm not abusing this work here, I'm just saying what it, what it is, because this work has been abused by people who would prefer a world of clinical freedom and clinical judgment. That's not what we're saying. So I'm going to just take this as factual. So John Ioannidis has published a, a couple of decades' worth of information uh, showing things um, like... Um, you, you, you know, uh, randomised controlled trials and systematic reviews basically uh, produce false findings. Uh, and what was really interesting, right, I'm going to try and say Vaz's name. I don't know if you saw Vaz Karakakis. Did I get it right? Oh, VK. I, um, Vaz had a post poster here on Monday or Tuesday. Um, systematic reviews cannot inform clinical practice. I was, I was, I was, I bought into that title not not because I've got some sort of bias. I was just really interested in what he had to say, and he was saying a similar thing to what John United says. If you look at the if you look at the structure of, of trials, you look at what happens, you look at all the stuff around it, you come to this conclusion where the, the, they they perhaps aren't doing what. What, what they say on the tin. So the initial response to that, which is what we've taken so far, is, OK, trials need to be better. They just need to be better. They need to control better for risk of bias and such forth, which is one of the outcomes of John Ioannidis' work. Um, we looked at um, 93 trials in physiotherapy and wondered if they... Uh, I'm not going to go into what we mean by, by truth at the moment. You can talk to me at, at any stage after about that. But let's say there's, there's some sort of uh, perspective on what, what scientific truth is, and we can match trials to see whether they do that. We found that just under half the trials uh, published were, were true. And then we think, well, OK, that, that's not bad because, you know, there's a wide variety of quality of trials. So the, the, the poorer crop quality ones would be the false ones. But when we did the regression analysis, it turns out that the higher quality trials, high quality based on their uh, ability to control for risk of bias, were in fact more likely to produce false results uh, than true results. So making trials better isn't necessarily a solution to, to get a, getting better science. But of course, all this is a bit of a farce because we're using the very methods that, that trials use to assess if trials work or not. We're using the empirical approach. So it's a paradox of inquiry, and we can't really uh, sort of uh, put too much into that. So we have to appeal to other ways of investigating a phenomena, and there's a philosophical approach to this, so I'll talk about the philosophical problem, which is, you know, what, what's happening? What is science based on? What, what, what's the underpinning rationale for science? What is the scientific method? Could there be another scientific method? Could the scientific method we have be, be tweaked in some way or whatever? So we're not, we're not tweaking the methods. We're, we're tweaking the underpinning theory of science and see if, seeing if that can, can help us some way. And this has been done throughout history, of course. And um, so the project I'm involved in is, is partially... Well it, well, it is sort of... Um, fully related to this quest and that question. Can, can we have a reconceptualization of what we mean by the fundamental ideas of, of science? That sounds like a big thing. Um, but it has been done before throughout history. But it, it doesn't happen overnight. You don't just um, plug something into a, a, a spreadsheet and work out the new foundation theories of science. Um, they, take, they take time, and science is a slow progress. And just to sort of highlight that, which you know already, this is Austin Bradford Hill. He, he published the first randomised control trial in medicine in 1952, but the first description of a randomised control trial was reported in 600 BC in, in the book of Daniel. Um, so we could say... It, it took like almost 2,000 years before a, an idea of a reconceptualization of science started to manifest as scientific methods. You could say that. Um, but, but within that period, you know, things have, have changed as well. So to reconceptualize something so deep uh, and, and so ingrained in, in our world is, is not a quick or easy task. And we've got to be um, pedantic about this. This is where we have to really start asking hard, 
hard and detailed questions. So when we say clinical effectiveness, what does that even mean? When we say treatment works, what does that even mean? Does it work? That depends on what you mean by does it and work. That's um, philosophy for you. Uh, so we're going to break those things down, especially the work thing. So clinical effectiveness is, is what I will call a causal term. It suggests this causation at play. Effect suggests there's been a cause somewhere. And what we do in science is try and establish that cause. And randomized control trials do that in a specific way. Um, but is that, is that definition of work or, or explanation of work the same as what we mean when we're with a, with a patient and we want them to get better? Now, EBM would say, yeah, it's, it's the same. What we establish up here in trials in terms of effectiveness is the same as what you mean down here when you're, you're with a patient. But I'd like to challenge that a little bit. Uh, just a quick intro to the Cause Health team. Um, from your left to right there. Oh, I'll go from your right to left. I'll start with me. That's me on the right. And there's Svein Anders Norli. He's Norwegian. There's Tor Eric Eriksson. He's a... Uh, so Svein Anders is a Norwegian philosopher. Tor Eric is a Norwegian clinical psychologist. Ronnie Anjum is the project leader holding the dog. And Stephen Mumford is a professor of metaphysics and a uh, philosophy of science. And that, this was taken in 2002 in Buda, in Norway, where it was one of our first meetings where we started to talk about these problems. This was taken last year, and we're in the same order there, and there's a dog, oh look, do you see that dog? There's a dog there and a dog there. Neither of them have any of our dogs. That was a random dog that just sort of came along and Ronnie said, oh, we'll have that in the picture. And then five years later, another random dog came along with a lead on. And she said, oh, we'll have that in the picture again. Can you remember four years ago with that dog? I don't know why there's so many random dogs in Norway. Anyway, it's nothing to do with the thing. So anyway, this is, this is, a, this is a start of, of a project which has now got um, uh, 30 plus members from these areas of the world in. And we're all, this, this is the very question we're asking. Can the science that underpins evidence-based medicine be reconceptualized into something that is more person-centered and humanistic than it is now? Um, so very quickly, just to conceptualize how causation, so, so this is what we're talking about now, causation, the stuff that underpins what we do, the stuff that makes people better, the stuff that makes people ill, the, the cause. You can define what we mean by causation by looking at how evidence-based medicine works now, and you can do that by looking at the structure of evidence-based medicine, and it's quite easy, even though it took me about five years to work this out, I can, I can sum it up in less than a minute now. Uh, we know the hierarchical rules of evidence-based medicine in that studies from higher up the hierarchy more reliably inform uh, therapeutic decisions. That is the central claim of evidence-based medicine, what we can call the central claim. It's, it's not controversial. That's clearly explicitly um, uh, set, set out. We could have a discussion about hierarchies and levels. So Gray talk about levels now and say that it's non-hierarchical. Uh, that's nonsense levels of hierarchies, but this is the old school model, and just to clarify, this is the way EBM tends to sort of think. The stuff low down, we're not confident in making causal claims from, the stuff higher up, we can make causal claims from. So causation is something that belongs to higher quality comparative trials. There's a philosophical way of expressing that, and it's in Humean terms based on the philosophy of Scot... <gasps> it's Scottish, and we're in Scotland. I've just realised. David Hume was Scottish, and we're in Scotland. <laughs> Amazing. Um, but he died ages ago, so you won't see him. Um, and the Humean theory of causation is one that we call regular, a theory of regularity, the regularity's view of causation. In other words, what we do in high quality observational studies, which can be upgraded to the level of RCTs in, a, in, in the grade system, or high quality comparative studies, we look for regularly occurring events. And once we see those events occur, we start to have confidence in saying this causation. And there's a criteria, there's a constitution behind this. So the events have to be contiguous. They have to be close to each other. 
you know, in time and space. And uh, we've just published a paper, uh, David Evans, a, 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 a very broad and forward-thinking osteopath, and Nick Lucas and I published a paper looking at time, form, and space in terms of, of what human causation means. One thing is they have to be close together in time, form, and space. And there has to be temporal priority. The cause has to come before the effect. And this, this is what humanism is all about. And there has to be a constant conjunction. You have to see it time and time and time again. And that's what, that's what trials do. And part of um, causation could never include what Hume called necessary connection. And that's his spelling of it with an X there, the old, old school spelling. In other words, what he meant was, you don't need to understand the causal substance of something. You don't need, so, so in our terms, you don't need to understand the mechanisms of why something works as long as you've got good regularity shown by po population data. Now, if you think about the, 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 the balance of uh, science this, this uh, week, it's been about 50-50. We've had lots of excellent mechanistic research and we've had lots of uh, um, uh, population data presented. And, and we, 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 we accept that both of those things are important, but taking EBM literally, population data always trumps mechanisms because of the levels and the hierarchies. So, you know, explicitly some people say this, the real hardcore proponents of, of evidence-based medicine. In fact, they'll go as far to say, Understanding mechanisms has led us astray in the past and caused harm to lots of people. Think of Dr. Spock's advice on, on the way children sleep, et cetera, et cetera. It's only when you tap into the regular occurrence of something happening that you can tr start to truly understand causation. So there's no room for mechanisms in, in, in our science. Um, so we've got data. So we talk about data. We talk about the phenomena of data, and in our sense... Uh, we talk about population data. And is there, is, there, is there a difference between data and the stuff it relates to? This was really interesting. Some of you might have seen this uh, at the Science Museum on Sunday evening if you were there. Um, it was a, it's a complex system. It's a relatively simple complex system. I'll just play it for you. Look at the yellow uh, dangly thingy. So the guy was explaining this to me. Uh, to, to a couple of us who was there, and he said, I see the hat and yellow thing, keep in that, I love you, dear. And then, um, then I got an English person to explain it, <coughs> and they said, um, keep your eye on the yellow dangly thing, uh, its movement is unpredictable, it's chaotic, it's a chaotic complex system. But you can model this. You can model this mathematically, and he, he was talking about the, the, um, the, the mathematical modeling of it, because you can model it because each component part in there is measurable and predictable in its own right. But, you put, you, but they've run test after test on this, and not once has the, math, the complex mathematical model been able to predict the movement of the yellow arm there. So it's a truly chaotic system but it looks like it could be really measurable. So I'm wondering if our world is, 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 is of the level of cha chaoticness and complexity and context sensitivity as, as, a, as a simple model of that. And I would say our world is more chaotic and complex than this, and science tries to, to, to make that simpler and find the invariables and the invariants in a chaotic world. And I'm wondering if, if, if uh, that can ever be achieved. Uh, a <clears throat> quick plug, but I'm not plugging the sales of these T-shirts. I'm just saying you that these are uh, some slogans that, that give you an insight into the sort of things we're talking about in Cause Health. Statistics don't get me. This isn't dismissive of population data. They're just saying population data doesn't necessarily get the, the, the person, the N equals one person. <laughs> Uh, I'm more than my omics. The genome project is great, but uh, we might ask our humans more than just their genes. Causation is not your enemy. We believe that causation is in the mechanisms of something and then we build up. Um, and one size does not fit all. Population data gives us a clue. Um, and I'm going to tell you a phrase now which I really like. It's a phrase of Stephen Mumford's that we. Uh, I'll give him the claim, but we did come up with it during a, a supervision session, and I, I think I half came up with it, but I, I do give him the claim. Randomised control trials, etc., we think are constitutive of causation. They, they are what causation is, as I've just said. How about this for a nice phrase? 
Randomized controls, controls trials are not constitutive of causation, but they are symptomatic of causation. They might tell us where causation lies, but it, they don't necessarily do. The, the true effectiveness comes, comes at, at, at this level, which may or may not be picked up by population data. Now, I'm just going to do a little game with you. Can everybody... Um, so, right, we'll pretend this is a, an epidemiology study, OK? And the, pop, the defined population is IFOMP delegates. So that's the population we're talking about. And I want everybody who's an IFOMP delegate to stand up, please. Anybody who's an IFOMP delegate at IFOMP Glasgow 2016, please stand up. Now, if my predictions are correct, that should be everybody. <laughs> Otherwise, you haven't paid, and we'll have to get the, Chris, the security guy, to, to, to throw you out. So if everybody's standing up as an IFOMP delegate, that's our defined population. Now, I want to know the relationship between IFOMP delegates, the population, and an IFOMP delegate, and I want to see how similar they are. Can everybody who's not a physiotherapist stand, sit down? If you're not a physiotherapist, sit down. Okay, a few people have sat down. If you are female, sit down, please. Okay. If you are European, can you sit down? That means English people can stay still. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If you wear glasses, can you sit down? Okay. If you are over the age of 40, can you sit down? These things I'm saying, I'm pretending here, but these, these in, a, in a epidemiology, could, uh, uh, it's an analogy of the causally important factors, the layers of information that come from a population. Okay. If you are not wearing a jacket, can you sit down? Okay. I'm making stuff up. Okay. If you are not wearing a jacket. If you are wearing a suit, can you sit down? And if you are wearing just a T-shirt, can you sit down? And if you are wearing... Um, yeah, OK, right. And if you are wearing a black jacket, can you sit down? <laughs> <laughs> right. Now, um, you, sir, at the back, I'm going to class your jacket as a suit jacket, so I want you to sit down. And I'm looking around, I've got one person left who's wearing a blue waistcoat. Now, he's our, he, he, he's our IFOMP delegate from a population of IFOMP delegates. Your characteristics, this should work out now, is that you're wearing a blue jacket, you're non-European, you're under 40, um, and you're male, and you're a physio. Okay. Now, the, the definition of IFOMP delegates was uh, they, were, they, came, they were of various ages, they came from around the world, they were of at least two genders, um, and they were wearing a variety of clothes. You, sir, are, are none of those things. Yeah? Looking upwards, you are none of those things. What you are is... Um, You're not an outlier, you're, you're the person you are. N equals one. You are you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. He is, he is him, he is a human with characteristics that are causally important that have no relationship to the definition of the, of, of the population. So where does this leave us? What can we say about evidence of therapeutic effectiveness? When this guy is doing this, how does he know that this is clinically effective in some sort of scientific way? How does he know that that army guy there, the individual, well, he could appeal to trials, which he should do, bearing in mind that the trial might just be symptomatic of causation and not constitutive of it. Um, here, I've shown this a few times. And I'm just going to play it for a few seconds. We're going to call this a, a, an, an intervention. It's an extreme example of an intervention, and a very simple one. It's of a physiotherapist preventing a, a patient from falling. So 
she's intervening on his health. So we could use manual therapy, but it's just more complex to, to discuss this idea. So this is a really simple thing. Where is the evidence of therapeutic effectiveness? Where is the clinical, where, where is the evidence that the intervention works is causally significant? I've, and that, that's, it's not a rhetorical question. I want you to answer that if you want. Where is the evidence? What if we had a randomised control trial that said, or a systematic review of randomised control trials that says putting your arms up in front of a falling patient is ineffective, it doesn't work? What would you believe as a human being? What would you believe? And I've actually had this discussion quite a lot, and some people have said I would believe the trials because my human observation is bias. And I don't believe that that person stopped that person falling. I, I would have to appeal to some population data that showed that this was a regularly occurring event before I believed that. Now, I find that a bit problematic because I think the evidence for therapeutic effectiveness is right there. It's right there with that patient and with that physiotherapist and with the alliance between them. This is a metaphysical problem. Stephen Mumford says, bad metaphysics cost lives. The, the reconceptualization of causation, I'm not going to talk about the, the model that we're, we're using, which is called causal disposition in, in any detail, but we think of cause as a, a real-time evolving process that brings out the dispositional aspects in a single individual manifests and, uh, and combines and manifests in the causal event as a process and that process has some, some parts of that process can be captured like by, by a randomised controlled trial. Some parts of the process can't be captured in our present evidence-based medicine model. Um, mechanisms is a process that we want to capture and we should, we, we should value that and also the individual narrative and the emergent uh, features of a patient uh, should be captured as a process. And this ties in with what um, the campaign for, for real evidence-based medicine is, is saying. Demands individualised evidence. Evidence-based medicine should demand individualised evidence. Now... I'm just going to skip these two slides and probably go back to them. I'm not talking about personalised medicine. That, that's a different thing, and we, we, we don't really like the idea of, of, of a genome-based personalised medicine. That's missing the point. It's missing the human being. Pain, for example, could be an emergent property of the biopsychosocial model. It's no longer bio, it's no longer psycho, it's no longer social. It's something else. How do we capture that? And that something else can, has got to be context sensitive. So how do we understand Joss Naylor? How do we understand um, Hank Williams? We can understand them by understanding them as, as, as human beings themselves being a valid source of evidence of clinical effectiveness. But to do that, we need to readjust how we think about the framework of evidence medicine. I've put what is our research vision. It's probably what is my research vision, because these are just my, my thoughts. This is what I think the next 20, 30 years should hold. We should be, get better at contextualising population data rather than contextualising our patients in population data. We've been looking down the telescope the wrong way. Let's turn it round. Reconceptualise fundamental ideas that underpin the scientific basis of our research methods. Embrace complexity. Don't control for it. The whole of the scientific method is all about controlling for complexity. We should embrace complexity and use that as the starting point for how we understand the world. Work across disciplines, especially the humanities. Our business is with humans. Humanities is all about humans. Place people, not patients, at the heart of our research. Person-centred care is different to patient-centred care. In the Oxford English Dictionary, the opposite of patient is agent. 
You call somebody a patient, you take all of their agency away. And Stephen Tyman, another great osteopath, has written about that. We want person-centred, humanistic-led, scientific research. Thank you and fare thee well. Thank you very much to Roger. Um, I have a couple of questions from the floor. Um, the first one, I think, wins a prize for the uh, best question of the week, if I can understand it. So, should we reconceptualise the biopsychosocial model to a more uniform humanistic model? Does the biopsychosocial model lead to the regular Cartesian dualistic interpretation of human experience? Well, uh, that's a great question. Um, who's the geek then? <laughs> Um, that is great. I think that obviously the biopsychosocial model has is, 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 uh, is, is, is changed the way we think about things, and that's all down to George Engel, and, that, and that's great. We wrote a paper a couple of years ago at the Borders of Medical Reasoning where we, we got criticised, mainly by Jack Chu, about having a go at the biopsychosocial... Not really. It was, it was a good criticism and, and, and a much-needed one. Which is, uh, because we, we uh, accused the biopsychosocial model of, of uh, still being a reductionist um, model of healthcare because we are reducing the human down to those three things and we padded that out with some de detail. So I think we could reinterpret what, what the biopsychosocial model is and I think you know, we're bordering on the time, time to do that now. And just one more. Um, if the results of RCTs are untrue and findings of um, systematic reviews unable to guide practice, should we reject what we've heard and learnt this week? No, no, no. This is, um, you know, I, I should have, I should have foregrounded this with, with the thing about, you know, some of this is you're not going to like. Some will be a bit negative, might sound a bit negative, but we need to finish on a high here. No, the answer to that is simply no. All we're doing is, 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 is having to think about how we could reinterpret what we're reading from those specific. Uh, so, population, population data gives us fantastic information. It gives us information about populations. Uh, all, all, all we're saying is we can, um, as I say, contextualise that data uh, in the context in, in, within, our, within our patients. So we're not dismissing anything. All, all of this scientific research is good. What we're saying is, what is it telling us when we say something like, what is the best evidence for therapeutic effectiveness? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.